I think everybody pretty much knows we live in a multi-level, fast-paced, turbocharged, gotta have it now, can't wait till tomorrow world. Our attention span is a lot of times very short. The average attention span of the notoriously ill-focused goldfish is nine seconds. But according to a new study from Microsoft, People now generally lose concentration after only about eight seconds. Researchers in Canada surveyed 2,000 participants and studied brain activity in 112 individuals using EEGs. And they found that since the year 2000, about when the mobile revolution began, the average attention span has dropped from 12 seconds to eight seconds. That actually means that a goldfish can concentrate longer than we can. So I would venture to say that by way of that introduction, we need to focus. We need to focus on things that are important, no doubt about that. And this morning, I want us to take a focused look at a very particular verse, just one verse. And it's Matthew 6 and verse 33. Now, that verse is actually on the front of your bulletin. I adopted it as a motto For this church. So let's read that verse together. Why don't we just read that together. And then we'll go from there to focus on that verse. You ready? Big voice. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now we're going to break that passage down this morning. And we're going to break it down into manageable pieces to where we can actually take them and break it apart and see how each piece applies to us. The first piece of that verse is the principle, and that's seek. And all of us understand that. We understand what seeking means. I mean, even from the time that we're little bitty kids, we probably all played hide and go seek. You've probably been to Easter egg hunts and when you were a kid and and maybe have watched as your kids or friends' kids that got out there and searching for Easter eggs. As a teenager, maybe you went on a scavenger hunt. We used to do those when I was a teenager. But we need to understand the concept of seeking. We understand what it is. We need to understand what it's not. Seeking is not walking around with your eyes closed. All right? It's not that. It's not occasionally making an effort to find something. And it's not randomly hoping that what you're looking for is going to fall right into your lap. Let me tell you what seeking is. According to Webster, seeking means to go in search of, to look for, to try to discover, to ask for, to try to acquire or gain, to make a search or an inquiry. Now, personally, Webster is pretty thorough, but not near as thorough as the word that's used here by Jesus when he stated this verse. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, the Greek word for seek is zeteo. It means to seek in order to find, to seek a thing, to seek in order to find out by thinking, meditating, reasoning, to inquire into, to seek after, to seek for, to aim at, to strive after, to seek, to require, to demand, to crave, to demand something from someone. So when we read Jesus' definition of seek, we get it. It means more than just sort of looking for something. It means meditating on it, thinking about it, reasoning, inquiring, seeking after, diligently striving after it, to require it, to crave it. It's bigger than sometimes we realize. Scriptures help us. Hebrews, the 11th chapter and verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In Colossians 3 and verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. And then Paul would actually tell the church at Rome to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So when we look at the Bible's definition of that principle to seek, we see it involves diligence. 
Those who diligently seek Him. A heaven mindset. Seek those things which are above. Patient continuance in doing well and doing good. It's not an accident. It's intentional and it is a decision. I am going to seek this. That's the principle. But also we need to see the persons. Ye. If you have a King James Version, seek ye first. That means you. Let me translate it for you. That actually means you. And you may leave here this morning and go, boy, the, the preacher sure was preaching at Joe. And he sure needs it. I know I've done that before. But we need to realize that sometimes what God has to say is for us. You see, I heard it said one time, the hardest faults there are to find are those faults that God calls mine. Sometimes it's hard. Let me tell you who I'm preaching to this morning. I'm preaching to the person sitting behind the person sitting in front of you. Let me say that again. I'm preaching to the person sitting behind the person sitting in front of you. I'm preaching to you. Listen, if we, we get this. We get this in everyday life. If Bill Gates were to walk up to you and say, hey, I got a check for you. You understand that. Don't forget the church gets 10% of that, all right? <laughs> if the random house publisher knocks on your door and says, hey, I've got a check for you, you get that, right? And if Hulk Hogan tears his shirt off and says, hey, I'm talking to you, run when you get to that one, all right? Just get out of there. But we need to understand, listen, when Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, he was talking about you. He was talking about me. We have to get that point. Jesus pounded personal accountability. 48 times. 48 times within the four gospels. Jesus said. Verily I say unto you. And the scriptures put it forth in all different flavors. Matthew 7 and verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge. Ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet. It shall be measured to you again. Matthew 12 and verse 36. But I say unto you. That every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. John 12 and verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that last day. Now Jesus didn't say these things. He, he didn't say all of these things where he put you and me in there. He didn't say all of that to fill the air with words. He said it because it was something we need to hear. He was talking to us. And we need to get that. Listen, we can try to elude it. We can run away from it. We can deny it. But there's a day coming no one will deny it. He's talking to me. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 9 through 12 says, Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him, speaking of Christ, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let me tell you who's going to hold your hand at the day of judgment. Nobody. You say, well, wait a minute, Jesus is going to be there. Jesus is no longer going to be your advocate at the day of judgment. He is going to be your judge. You will stand before him and give an account of your life. If you've been parted to the right, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. But if you have not been obedient child of God, he'll say, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We get the concept of who the person is here. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. But that brings us to the next thing. The priority. Seek ye first. Now I, I don't quite get it. But something here often gets lost in translation. From the real world to God. And I'm not sure why it gets lost in translation. But it gets lost. Things that are simple for us to understand in the real world. Become completely difficult for us when we're translating it over to our relationship with God and what God calls us to do. Listen, if you go to work tomorrow morning and your boss comes up to you and he says, the first thing I want you to do today is such and such, you, if you got any sense, are going to go, okay, that's what I need to do first. 
If your boss comes up to you tomorrow morning and says, the first thing I want you to do is such and such or you're not going to get paid on Friday. Now you really get it. I guarantee it. The first thing you're going to do is whatever he wants you to do. Because he said that's the first thing he wants you to do. And if he walks up to you tomorrow morning and he says the first thing I want you to do today is such and such. And if you don't, you're going to get fired. I guarantee it. You will get that and understand it. Why is it we don't get this? When Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. He made it absolutely clear. In Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, same sermon, Sermon on the Mount. He said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Matthew 10, verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We, we get this seeking first because of some of the things that Jesus said. Seek the kingdom of God. Lay up for yourselves treasure. Love me above all others. And then in Matthew 5, again, same sermon. If your right eye offend you, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's more profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish than thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if your right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It's profitable for thee that one of thy members perish and not that thy whole body be cast into hell. We get the priority aspects of Christ. We understand that. We get it. He made it absolutely clear. We need to understand that first means first. It doesn't mean second. It doesn't mean third. It doesn't mean a distant fourth. It means first. And when you get to judgment, let me tell you something. Brothers and sisters, when you get to judgment, all the fluff, all the puff, and all the stuff ain't going to be enough. That's all there is to it. It won't be enough. You have got to have that relationship to where you set a priority on this. Where you made this the most important thing. You might be able to tap this your way around your trouble with your boss. Or you might be able to fool everybody in the church. But when it comes down to Christ, you are not going to deceive him. You're not going to be able to tap dance around it. He knows where you put your priorities. And you need to understand, he says he needs, and this kingdom, the kingdom of God needs to be first. He even, he even used a, an extremism to make it crystal clear. I actually touched a little bit on this last week in our closing clip. But Luke 14, 25 through 27 says there were great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. For whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, that's an extremism. Jesus was using that term hate. Listen, Jesus is not an advocate of hate. But what he was actually saying here, this is a, a priority issue. What he was saying here is when it comes to me and the relationship that you have with me, your love for me has to be so much more. So much more than your love for your husband or your wife or your father or your mother or your children or your sisters and your family. Even your own life. Your love for me has to be so much higher that comparatively speaking, your love for everything else and everyone else looks like hate. That's an extremism. He wasn't advocating hate, but he was saying, this is where I need to be. Seek ye first. The kingdom of God. So we get the principle. We get the people. We get the priority. We also need to see the place. And that's the kingdom of God. Now as restorationists. Those who just simply want to go back to the Bible. To just be Christians. Nothing more. Nothing less. Nothing else. We have a leg up on denominations here. Because most denominations are still waiting for the kingdom of God to come. And I've dealt with this before, so I'm going to hit it real fast. But because of the Jews rejected Jesus, a lot of denominations believe because the Jews rejected Jesus, God had to set up the church instead of the kingdom. He had to go to plan B, a call at the line of scrimmage, and set up the church instead of the kingdom. And the problem with that is, one, it, it makes God not omniscient. He didn't know what was going to happen. It, the completion of the scheme of redemption falls subject to the will of men. And then it just plain contradicts scripture. 
It just plain contradicts scripture. They miss the meaning of the church. See, we understand that the kingdom is the church. Jesus told Peter, I will give to you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And within a couple of verses, he says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preached the first gospel sermon in the name of a risen redeemer. And 3,000 people said, what must we do? He told them what they needed to do. He didn't tell them to pray a prayer. He didn't tell them to invite Jesus into their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. He told them, because they believed his message, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter opened the doors to the kingdom and that day according to the last verse of Acts the second chapter that day the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved 3,000 people became members subjects in the kingdom of God. Jesus in Luke, the ninth chapter in verse 27 said, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Other scriptures that confirmed the kingdom came in the first century, Matthew 12 and verse 28, if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come unto you. He was speaking to his enemies who were accusing him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Colossians, the first chapter in verse 13, Paul would tell the church at Colossae, who, speaking of God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You can't put me in something unless that something exists. And the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews 12 and verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The kingdom came. What's your point? The kingdom of God is the church. And Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Why is the church important? Because it's a building, because it has two by four. Lumber is really expensive now. So the value of real estate has to be going up. Why is the church important? It's not because of lumber. It's not because of cinder blocks or nails or all the other stuff that go to putting a building together. It's because the church is the people. The church is the people. It actually comes from the Greek word ekklesia. It means the called out. Those who have been called out of the world and have become followers of Christ. Let me tell you something. Jesus didn't die for buildings. And I know that because the Bible says in Acts 20 and verse 28, as Paul is speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus, he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, here's where we try the shoe on to see if it fits. Where does the church, the kingdom of God, Fall in your priority system. Where's it at in your life? What place do you give that kingdom of God? And you say, well, I'm still not convinced it's the church. I think he's talking about heaven. Fine, let's go that way too. How important is that to you? Where does it fall in your priority system? We need to understand the principle to seek the persons, you, the priority, first, the place, the kingdom of God. And then we come to the prize, his righteousness. And we need to understand the difference between imputed righteousness and attained righteousness. I know you understand this to a point because I've been preaching on it for a whole year since I've been here. I've preached on it adequately. But the scriptures say in Romans the fourth chapter in verse 3, what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted, some versions say, imputed unto him for righteousness. So God actually imputes us by virtue of our faith. Are trusting Christ, obeying Christ, by virtue of that, he imputes to us righteousness. But there's a danger in preaching imputed righteousness. There's a danger because some people think, well, if God's going to impute it to me, then I don't really need to do it. I don't really need to strive for that. Wrong. Wrong. Righteousness is something that the Christian must strive for. In Acts the 10th chapter, as Peter speaks to those Gentiles who are about to come into the kingdom of God, who are about to be a part of the church of the living God, Peter opened his mouth and said unto them, I perceive God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. In Matthew the 5th chapter in verse 6, Blessed are those who do hunger 
and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I think that has to do with our striving for it and God's giving it to us. In Matthew 5 and verse 20, Jesus said, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let me tell you something. Righteousness is something God gives us, but striving for righteousness is something that we do. It's something that we engage in. And let me tell you, it's not easy. The scriptures even bear that out. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, If we know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Paul would actually say to that young preacher Titus in Titus 2 verses 11 and verse 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. Those passages point to the fact that you and I have to strive for righteousness. Don't kid yourself and think that I don't have to do anything. All I got to do is just simply accept God's grace and mercy. We do have to accept God's grace and mercy. But Peter would actually say to that crowd on the day of Pentecost, you have an obligation. You have an obligation to respond. He said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourself. There's something that we do. We strive for this prize, this righteousness. And we have a pattern. We have a pattern Jesus lived a righteous life for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons Christ lived a righteous life. I mean, he could have died innocent as a babe at the hand of Herod the Great. But he grew up and he lived a flawless, perfect life. There's a reason for that. Because God can take his righteous life and actually attribute it to us to impute that righteous life to us. Not only does he take away our sins at the cross, he actually imputes to us the perfect life of Jesus who lived without any sin. Having committed no sin. But listen, we need to get this. The righteousness of Christ, that's our pattern too. It's our pattern. Jesus would actually say right before, right before he goes to the cross, the night before he goes to the cross, in John 13, 15 through 17, he says, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he that is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Let me ask you a question. Where does righteous living fall in your list? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. If we're going to fulfill not only the principle, be the people that he's talking to, set the priority, have the place, enjoy the prize. We need to understand those things, but we also need to get the portion. Here he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And you might say, well, what things is he talking about? Well, you've got to go back a little bit before, 25 to 32. Remember, this is verse 33. In 25 to 32, Matthew 6, he says, Therefore, I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows you have need for all of these things. And then he says, but seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's our portion. Our food, 
our shelter, our clothing. That's our portion, the necessities of life. Jesus was dealing with the necessities of life. And God will always come through there. He will always come through there. If we do our part, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he'll take care of all those things. David actually said in Psalms 37, in verse 25, he said, I have been young and now am old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Now, I want you to think about that. David's saying, I once was young. I get it. I'm David. David, I get it. I once was young and now I'm old. But I've never seen his seed. I've never seen, listen, I've had people that needed help and the church was there to help them. They ran into a difficulty. I've seen people's houses burn down. And guess what? The church rallies around them and has car washes and takes care. They never are in need. Yes, a catastrophe, your house burned. Oh, absolutely. But the church was there for them to help them, individuals. I've actually... Seen people pull the keys out and say, here, you need a car and give them a car. But let me tell you what this isn't. This is not prosperity gospel. It's not about a mansion on a hill, a Royce Royce in the garage, mink stilettos and Gucci's in the closet. I don't know what all of that even actually is. I looked it up on the Internet. All right. What's a Gucci? I don't even know what that is. Prosperity gospel, let me tell you what. It's rapidly becoming a Christless Christianity and a crossless Christianity. When Jesus said these things, he was talking about the necessities of life, not the fantasies of life. He was talking about that which you need. And we need to focus not so much on that prize or that portion that we receive from God, but the God who provides them. Matthew 6, 33 is not about things. It's about the God of provision. God who hears and answers prayers. God who forgives as we forgive others. God who has heaven waiting on us when life is over here. God who clothes us and feeds us. The God in whom you exist. You, every breath in your lungs right now is because God lets you continue to live in this world so that you might do good and respond to him. A God who became poor so that we could enjoy the riches of heaven. The things that's here in Matthew 6 and verse 33, that's our portion. The one who gives them to us, that's our provider. And then finally, in Matthew 6 and verse 33, we need to see the promise. These things shall be added Unto you. Now Matthew 6 33 is has two major parts. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the condition. And then the promise. All these things shall be added unto you. The promise stands head and shoulders above all the other promises that we can actually think about. Why? Because it's connected to the one who spoke it, to the one who told us about this, to the God that cannot lie. Now, we understand that Jesus was the second person of the Godhead. John 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14 of John 1, it says, The Word was made flesh. So we get that Jesus was God, the second person of the Godhead, and God can't lie. Numbers 23 and verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. Jesus, right before he goes to the cross in John 17 and verse 17, as he's praying to God, the father says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And in Titus 1 and verse 2, he says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And the Hebrew writer will say in Hebrews, the sixth chapter in verse 18, two immutable things. It's impossible for God to lie. That we might have strong consolation who had fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. When I first became a Christian, I don't do it much anymore because I don't like getting them off. But I used to have bumper stickers on my bumper of my vehicle. And when I first became a Christian, I found a bumper sticker I really liked. The bumper sticker said, God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. I actually... Should have found a different bumper sticker that said it like this. God said it. That settles it. And I believe it. Because when God says something, it's settled. 
It is absolutely settled. God is so righteous. His character is such. He cannot lie. He cannot speak an untruth. If he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now, don't miss the conditional aspects of the promise. Listen, John 3 and verse 16 is conditional. Some people think, well, there's nothing you can do to be saved. John 3 and verse 16 says, whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. There's a condition. Now, if you understand the word belief, you understand that it includes action. It's pistuo. It means faith, trust, joined with obedience. It means repentance. It means confession. It means baptism. It means a faithful Christian life. It means all of those things. And you need to get that when you read the Gospel of John. But in Isaiah, the first chapter, verses 18 through 19, Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. That's a conditional statement. We understand that. Isaiah 48, in verse 18, God would say to Israel, If only you had paid attention to my commands. Your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like waves of the sea. They did not obey the words of his command. The conditional promise of Matthew 6 and verse 33 is exactly that. It's a promise, but it has conditions. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6 and verse 33 is connected to not just the promise here. That all these things shall be added unto you. But every word. Every word that Jesus spoke in regard to bigger promises. In John 8 and verse 51, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. He wasn't talking about physical death. He was talking about spiritual death. In John 8 and verse 12, he said, he spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In John 8 and verse 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word. Did you catch that? If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In John 8 and verse 36, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And then in John 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I'm just in John. That's all I'm doing is a few verses from John. But all of these promises are connected to this promise because they fell from the same lips. The lips of the precious Lord Jesus Christ. They're bigger promises. Bigger promises and one of those promises is true, complete, absolute peace. You know why a lot of church folk don't have a clue what Paul means when he talks about a peace which surpasses all understanding? You want to know why they don't get that? It's because they've never done it. They've never sought first the kingdom of God. They, they come and they go and they do a little bit here and a little bit there. But they, they, they just don't get it all the way. You know, some of them just say, well, you know, I'm, I don't got, I got to go fishing. I told my boss I'd meet him this afternoon. We'll play around the golf. I can't do church too. And, and they set that. Listen, anytime you choose to set God aside, I don't care if it's a worship service or a Bible study or anything else. You've chosen to set God somewhere other than first place. It's really just that simple. I'm sorry. It really is that simple. And if it gets on your toes, listen, got on my toes this morning at four o'clock when I was studying this. All right. I'm always getting on my toes. When I point three finger, one finger at you, I have three of them pointing back at me. So don't get mad. But listen, if you want that peace that surpasses all understanding, go all in. Get in this to where you lay your head down at night and you know I'm not playing with this. I'm not playing footsies with God. I'm not trying to figure out the loophole so I can get around, get under, get over, do something to where I can get to heaven without doing what God wants me to do. Go all in. Give him everything. And I guarantee it when you lay your head down at night, you'll know if I die tonight, I go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a promise from a God who cannot, cannot, will not ever lie. And let me tell you what Matthew 6 and verse 33 is. It is a perfect plan. It is a perfect charter 
for your life because there you see the principle to seek, to seek diligently. You see the person, me, you, we're the ones that have to do it. You see the priority first and foremost. You see the place, the kingdom of God, his church, the body that he died for. You see the prize, everything that we need, not just, not just physically, but everything that we need spiritually will be ours. And all the promises of Jesus are connected to Christ come through here in this perfect charter for our lives. It takes the life that is out of balance and it puts it into balance. And so let me ask you how you're doing. How are you doing this morning? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to start that journey. Because you can't seek God first until you do what God says you need to do to become a Christian. And the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says that you need to repent of your sins. That you need to be willing to confess Him before men. And then you need to be willing to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness and the remission of your sins. That's what the Bible says the plan of salvation is. Then you come up from that watery grave of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, and everything changes. The old priorities are no longer the priorities. Now you've got a new set of rules. Now you've got a new set of priorities. And that priority is God first and foremost. Everything, everybody else. Does it happen overnight? I guarantee it. You will not come up from that baptistry and immediately have everything worked out. But God is gracious and God is merciful and God is patient. And I'm not perfect, but the one who made me is and the one who will make me righteous and impute to me his righteousness. Look, I'm a, I'm a work in progress. You guys are going to figure that out. I've been here a year last Sunday. You guys are going to figure out, man, this guy, he's a work in progress. He is not there yet. And you're like, you know what? You're right. Don't get in front of me when we're driving, brother. Get out of the way. I got a big truck. I'll run right over you. I'll repent later, I promise. <laughs> but if you're a Christian, maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't got these priorities straight. Get them straight. Because I guarantee you, I look around. Everyone here, pretty much the kids are in another room, but everyone here, 40 years, you're probably going to be on the other side. Maybe 50 if you're really younger than I think you are, I can't tell from up here, maybe 60. But you will leave and you will meet him face to face. And the only thing that's going to matter to you in that very, very real reality, the other side, the only thing that's going to matter to you is where did I put the Lord Jesus Christ? Where did his church fit into my life? That's all that's going to matter. It's about priority. And first and foremost, the priority to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Those are priorities. And that's all that's going to matter.